Okay, uh, so let us get back to our local search and uh, the keywords that you must keep in mind is optimization. Remember that we converted a state space search problem to an optimization problem by saying that we want the best value for the heuristic function and essentially we are developing these local search algorithms to explore the surface defined by the heuristic function which we are now calling evaluation function because that is what the op optimizing community calls it and looking for minimum or maximum value as the case may be. And because we are exploring local search algorithms which means that the algorithm will not necessarily search the entire space, but will terminate using some criteria before that essentially. We have the problem of local optima and essentially we are exploring these different algorithms to try and get around this problem of local optima because the simplest algorithm that we saw hill climbing is very efficient it requires very little space in fact constant space or beam search for that matter which also requires constant space and it will just go up the slope and stop it will not take an exponential amount of time. But the trouble is that that is not what we want we want a global optima which may not be the maxima that the hill climbing will find. So, we are looking at ways of getting around or getting beyond those local optima. So, the first one method that we saw in the last class was taboo search essentially. And we had said that hill climbing we will associate with op, with exploitation and by this we mean exploitation of the heuristic function or exploitation of the local knowledge or the gradient that you can measure the gradient around you. And you will always follow the steepest gradient uh, path and this we will term as exploitation of the gradient essentially. Hmm. Now, optimization does not happen only in the computational world essentially I mean there is optimization happening in the physical world as well and in nature as well. We will see some examples from nature and from physical world. So, in physical world for example, when you talk of materials you want to produce materials of certain quality and very often this quality is dictated by the way its atoms are arranged. Uh, so, for example, if atoms are arranged in a nice uh, array like structure then you get good crystalline materials uh, or if atoms are arranged sort of close to each other in a metal then or in a ceramic then you get material which has good properties like good strength of material and things like that. Now, the way to arrive at materials with good properties very often involves creating a liquid version of that material and then solidifying it essentially. So, casting for example, you make a mold uh, and then you melt the material from which you want to make the cast and pour the material into the mold and then it solidifies and takes the shape of the cast essentially. So, that is how many of the bronze statues that you see are made essentially and there are many other things which are made by casting. Now, as I said the properties of these materials is dictated by the way that these atoms are arranged in them and it is desirable to arrange the atoms in a systematic fashion which in other words corresponds to low energy levels essentially. So, you want the final form to have low energy and in that sense you want to ha you have a minimization problem. Hmm. So, materials you want to be in minimum energy state 
So, you can imagine that if some material is in gaseous form, it has got a maximum amount of random movements happening and more energy and as it becomes liquid, the energy levels come down and as it becomes solid, the energy levels come down. But even in solids, if you can arrange the ma matter into minimum energy levels, then we get good properties of materials. Okay. And typically, the process that is used for minimum energy is called annealing. And by annealing, we basically mean controlled cooling. That you do not allow to cool the material at its own pace in some sense, but you make it cool slowly at a controlled rate, so that the atoms settle down into the minimum energy state. So, annealing is a physical process of minimization, uh, which is a kind of an optimization problem that we are also talking about and we will take some inspiration from annealing in a few moments. We have some which we call as random walk, which we associate with exploration. So, a random walk as the name suggests is that you take a step in any random direction or you make a move to any random neighbor essentially. And there is no other, no criteria which will tell you which, which neighbor to move to essentially. Now, hill climbing, you generate the neighbors of a given candidate, inspect their evaluation heuristic values or evaluation uh, function values, objective function values and choose the best amongst them and move to that essentially. Random walk is simply just taking a step in any random direction essentially. Now, obviously, you can see that random walk has this property of ex exploring the state space or the search space, whichever the search space is, it could be the solution space. But of course, it will not be guided, it will not have any desire to reach or stay still at a maxima essentially, just keep going on and on. So, one deterministic way that we saw of going beyond maxima in hill climbing, we saw was taboo tub search. But today, we want to look at a uh, non deterministic. Uh, or a stochastic uh, or randomized approach to exploring the space. And our goal is to have a judicious mix of exploration and exploitation. Exploration because it is exploration which will stop us from getting stuck at a local optima and exploitation because it is exploitation which takes us to optima in the first place essentially. So, it is just that we want to reach the global optima as far as possible. So, we do not want to have pure exploitation because we could have started in the wrong place and we would end up in a local optimal. So, as I mentioned in the end of the last class, we would want to make a move with a certain probability, which is controlled in such a fashion that if the move is a good move, then the probability is high and if the move is not a good move, then the probability is low. So, we will use the notation uh, C as current as we did in the last class, current node or and N as the next node. In hill climbing, N is the best amongst the neighbors, in random walk N is any random neighbor essentially of C. So, there is a relation between C. So, this is C and then there are many possible neighbors and one of them is N. Okay. So, associated with this C and this N, we will have their heuristic values or evaluation values, which you can call as uh, eval C for this node C. And for node n, we will have eval n. And if we are maximizing, then we want eval n to be greater than eval c. If you want minimizing, then we want it to be smaller essentially. So, which means that uh, hill climbing would have chosen the one with the maximum eval n value around here. But now we are given up this strategy of in inspecting all of them and then choosing the best amongst them. 
we are instead adopting a strategy in which we will just take a random neighbor and either move to it or not move to it essentially. So, this is a choice we will make that, that we will either move from C to N or we will remain at C, which means that at we will generate another random neighbor at that point and again either move to that or not move to that, hmm? which is a little bit different from what we have been doing so far essentially. In random walk we always move with 100 percent uh, surety that to the next neighbor, but we do not want to do that. We want to move with a certain probability and the probability should be such that for good moves uh, it should be high and good moves. So, we will associate the term delta E as eval n minus eval c and the equation that I am going to write is going to be for maximization uh, and you can just flip the sign for minimization essentially. So, this delta E is something that we want our probability to be influenced by. So, should we make this move from C to N? It depends upon what this delta E is. If delta E is positive, then I would more likely want to make a move with a high probability. If delta E is negative, which means that N is worse than C, I would still want to allow that move to be made because that is our goal to get off maxima essentially. We do not want to get stuck at maxima. So, we will allow even bad moves which means with negative delta E to be made, but with a lower probability essentially. So, the function that we will use for computing this probability will be a function of delta E and one more parameter uh, which will be we will use to control how this delta E influences the probability essentially. So, we want two things that delta E should influence the probability and secondly we want to control how delta E influences probability. Did anyone give a thought to this function? Or you might, might have read about it somewhere. So, the function that I will use. So, what is the nature of this function? We want a function of delta E. The function should be range should be limited to 1. It should be between 0 and 1 essentially because it is a probability we want to measure when we want to get a probability measure. Its domain should be infinite practically infinite because we are not going to put any constraint on how much is the difference between the evaluation function of two nodes. It could be a, to any degree essentially. So, we want a function which will stay within uh, this. Uh, so, let me draw that function here. I mean let me draw the domain at least. So, this is what my this thing is. So, this is going to be 1, this is going to be 0 and here let us say delta E is equal to 0 and here delta E is increasing and here in the opposite direction it is decreasing. Essentially. Delta E equal to 0 means the next node is has the same value as the current node essentially. So, obviously, you can imagine that you do not want to you do not care you can move to it or you do not move to it you are getting the same evaluation function obviously. So, we want a function which is going to be monotonically increasing as you go from left to right, but stay within these bounds. So, you can imagine there could be there is more than one function that you can choose to do that we will choose one and that function is called the sigmoid function. So, we will write this as following that uh, P it is the probability of making the move. So, let me just say P C n if you interpret it as saying that P C n is the probability of making a move from C to n is 1 over 1 plus this is basically the sigmoid function and like I said we will have a second parameter which will allow us to control how much delta E influences the probability. Because we should be able to work at any in some sense place in this spectrum uh, 
and the spectrum starts with hill climbing which means that the moment delta e is positive you will accept it with probability 1 the moment it is negative you will reject it with probability 1 or, or accept it with probability 0 and on the other hand is a random walk at the other extreme which means that it does not care whether delta e is positive or negative you will always accept it with probability 0 0.5 but we want to be able to operate anywhere in this range essentially so we need a second parameter and that second parameter traditionally is called t essentially So, this is a simple algorithm uh, generate. So, n is a random neighbor of C. So, let us assume we have a function called random neighbor of C, and then we say eval. delta e according to this formula eval n minus eval c and move with probability so it is a little bit like the random walk except If I may use the analogy of somebody being inebriated, this person is a little bit too inebriated that sometimes he does not even make a move. So, so, sometimes he makes a move, sometimes he does not make a move. So, sometimes he goes from C to N and sometimes he just stays there after and after a while makes another move or something like that. This algorithm is called stochastic hill climbing. So, I will just write H c for hill climbing. It is not purely hill climbing, hill climbing would only go in the direction of the steepest gradient, but this has a tendency to go in the direction of better values. So, we are still talking about maximization, so it still has a tendency to go up. So, let us inspect uh, some values uh, which I have got from this book. So, how to solve it? Uh, by Michelovitz and Pozen. So, they have given some examples. So, I am just taking their example. So, uh, what is the effect of delta E? Let us assume that T equal to 10 some value and we are using that value 10 here to compute this delta v e essentially. And let us assume that uh, eval c is equal to 107 some, some value and values better than 107 are good, values less than 107 are bad for us. So, let us construct a small table of values and see how it affects. So, this is the value for eval n. So, if this is 80, that means it is a not a good value, it is less than 107. So, delta E so I will write minus delta E here, minus delta E is 27, then E raised to minus delta E by T. Okay. This value is 14.88, and this is the probability. This is 0 0.06. So, if according to this formula, and this function is called the sigmoid function, if my eval n equal to 80, then I will move to it with a very small probability, as you can see, 0 0.06 essentially. So, six times out of 100, I will move to that node otherwise it will, I will not move to that and that is what we want essentially. We want the search to focus more towards better moves and less towards this. Let us look at some more examples if this is 100 this is a little bit better 
this becomes 7, this becomes 2.01 and this becomes 0 0.33. So, we are studying the effect of how this function sigmoid function responds to changing delta E essentially. So, it is still a bad value because we are starting with eval c equal to 107, we are still going 7 points lower and it is moving to that with one third probability essentially. Then just for the sake of completion, we take this, this happens to be 1.0 and 0 0.10, which is nice because what this function is telling us is that if eval n equal to eval c, you may or may not move to that, which means you move to it with probability 0 0.5 and you can stay back at the probability 0 0.5, which is what you would expect. Now, let us look at better values 120, this becomes minus 13, 0 0.27, 0 0.78. So, if you find a better value, then we will move to it with probability 0 0.78. How do we move to it with the probability 0 0.78? We discussed it in the last class. You generate a random number in the range 0 to 1 and if that number is less than 0 0.78, you move otherwise you do not move essentially. Less than or equal to 0 0.78. One more value 150 which is much better. So, this table basically which I have taken from this book illustrates how stochastic hill climbing responds to different values of delta E. As you can see if delta E is high and what you have written in here is neg negation of delta E, if delta E is high if you get a good improvement it makes a move with a greater probability otherwise it makes a move with a lesser probability. All this is for this value of t equal to 10 essentially. So, how do you choose this value is the next question, because we will see in a, in a moment uh, what is the influence of t essentially. Or let us first finish that and then we will do the discussion. So, now let us assume that we are looking at this case. sorry not this case. Uh, we are looking at this case which is a better case and let us see that if eval n equal to 120 and of course, eval c is 107, how does temperature affect the probability. So, let us look at different values of t, then we have e raise to minus 13 by t and then we have probability t. So, let us take a low value and we will assume 1 is a low value, this comes to and you can do this yourself actually. So, let me first write out these values with 5, it is 0.5, 
so this is how temperature affects this okay so i have used our term temperature and uh, in fact that that's a connection with annealing uh, that we will shortly see so we'll call this parameter temperature and delta e is also stand for energy in some sense uh, of course in this case we want to maximize otherwise we would have a formula in which this was the negation of instead of neg minus delta e you would have plus delta e if you wanted to minimize so how does this behave let's see at very low temperature or at very very low value of t the probability is 1 so you can see that this is like hill climbing if you keep this parameter low then it tends to behave like hill climbing well in the sense that if it sees a better move it will make it this then as temperature increases and this is where the analogy with real world materials comes into play the energy levels increase the entropy keeps increasing and so on and so forth or randomness keeps in, in improving and at very very high temperatures which is 10 raised to 10 the probability is 0 0.5 and you can see that that's a bit like the random walk so we can control the behavior of our probability function by controlling temperature if you want it to be more random we will keep high temperature so as you are approach 0 0.5 it is approaching a random walk it is more random essentially. irrespective of what value of delta e it will be 0 0.5 essentially so either so it will randomly make a move essentially if you wanted to make it so if you want to it to explore more you keep the temperature high making it behave like the random walk if you want it to follow the gradient then keep the temperature low making it behave a little bit like hill climbing essentially if it sees a well hill climbing in the sense that hill climbing always moves to a better spot the actual algorithm moves to the best amongst them but since we are generating only one we will take this as an approximation to hill climbing so it would move only if the node n was better than node c if temperature was low if temperature was high it would just move irrespective of whether this thing. So, as an exercise I would ask you to look at either of these values and construct the table for T and you will see that they would be similar thing that they would at high temperature they will it will still converge to 0.5 and at low temperatures it will converge to 0 towards 0 that it will not move at all essentially if, if you are getting a worse these, these two values are worse than this these two values are better than this essentially. So, we have looked at, we have seen the example of a better value. So, how does this sigmoid function look if you were to plot it? It depends on the parameter temperature. So, let us say this is a value of 0 0.5. So, this is all curves must pass through this point essentially. Why? Because we have said here that when delta E is equal to 0, it gives us a value of 0 0.5, and you can see that this is going to be irrespective of temperature because this term has become 0. So, irrespective of temperature this value is going to be 0 0.5. So, all the curves for all temperatures will pass through 0 0.5. When temperature is low this curve looks like this basically the step function so, this is t equal to 1. When temperature is high this curve looks like a straight line here this is what t equal to let us say 10 raise to 10 it is always 0 0.5 otherwise it behaves of it gives us a behavior which looks like the following. So, a typical sigmoid curve will cross this at some place and then go down towards 0 here and go up towards 1 here. So, this is a typical shape of a sigmoid curve and it is nice for us because we want a function which will uh, 
have the range of 0 to 1 and domain which is infinite. And as we change the values of temperature, the shape of this curve changes. So, uh, with a different temperature, the curve may look like this. So, as temperature goes down, this curve, this slope becomes sharper and sharper like this. And as the temperature goes up, it becomes flatter and flatter essentially. So, this is t raise to 10 is to 10, somewhere below there will be a curve which will be like this essentially. So, there is a series of curves. So, this is the direction of increasing t. The curves become flatter as t becomes like this. So, this is just the nature of this function, we are just looking at it to get some insights into what is happening essentially. Now, instead of saying that I will make a choice of the value t, we follow what is done in the physical world, which is to say that I will cool down the system gradually and hope that it will settle into an optimal state essentially. So, if we remove this and put in a clause where we initialize t to some value, let us say very high, whatever that very high value is. And very often the algorithm has two loops, there is one loop in which you do this loop a few times at a constant t, some people call it an epoch or something, but it does not matter, it is an inner loop in which you do this whole process. What is this process? Generating a random neighbor and either moving to it or not moving to it depending on how good that neighbor is given by this probability here essentially. You keep doing this a certain number of times and then you change t some monotonic decreasing function So, some thing, some function, uh, the simplest is t is equal to t minus 1, but that may not necessarily be the be best function. Now, this is a very empirical process. This function that we are looking for determines what these people call as the cooling rate. And this is most of the times determined empirically essentially, which means that you take a domain, do some experiments and try to see what works and what does not work and then try to keep that value. And then this is the outer loop. So, you do in the inner loop, you do this some number of steps, then you decrease the temperature and do some more number of steps essentially. So, what is the intuition behind this and simulated annealing, sorry it is called simulated annealing. This algorithm is a very well known algorithm called simulated annealing. It is very popular in the optimization community, it is used very often and this is basically the algorithm that you start at a high temperature which means you start with high random movement, allow the system to go to any candidate but gradually bring down the temperature and make it behave more and more like hill climbing. What would be the intuition? Why should it work? What is the idea behind this decreasing of temperature? How does that help? Decreases the randomness, that is what it does, but what is the intuition behind? Why does it work? Why does it help us find good values, good options? All in local meaning. Yeah, but remember that towards the end when T becomes low, it is going to behave more and more like hill climbing. How do you account for that fact? It is true that initially we want it to be behave randomly and then later on we want it to follow the heuristic function or, or 
what is changing over this period of time? It, that's high initially. Why do we want this high initially and and what is the effect of this cooling? You know, I have heard somebody say that this is like one of those toys uh, which has this concentric rings. You might have seen with some small uh, balls or ball bearing like objects inside them and you have to move them all towards the center. And this person who is a respected computer scientist said that you know it is a bit like you first move it randomly and then gradually you let it try to control the movement by tilting that object a little bit or something like that. So, let me give you an intuition uh, behind this. Uh, so, what is the claim that we are making? The claim that we are making is that in many problems this gives us very good solutions which means it gives us close to optimal solutions essentially. What are the ki kind of problems where this works? Where the surface is jagged essentially, uh, where hill climbing would have got stuck at the first local maxima or minima it is found, but this algorithm can get beyond many local ma maxima and move towards <coughs> better maxima. So, what is the intuition to say that it moves towards better maxima? Hmm? So, this is a basic idea that I want you to think about is that assume that that so there is this big jagged surface ok. So, let us say this is how your one dimensional surface looks like essentially. Hmm. It is jagged in the sense that hill climbing would depending on where it started hill climbing would have got stuck in one of these local maxima. But we are saying that something like simulated annealing will go very close to the global maxima. Essentially. So, the idea is this essentially that take a sort of snapshot of this which looks like this. Like this, which is a like one of these things here. Let us call this point A and let us call this point B and let us call this point C. And we want to maximize, which means we want this value to be high, higher and higher. We want to go to C rather than to A, we want to go to the top of this. Now, in this one dimensional world, which means you know these are the set of candidates and these are the heuristic functions and you can move either left or right. You want to not get stuck at A, but you want to be at C and then this argument will apply all over this slope essentially here. Essentially. Now, you can see that to move from A to B, it has to overcome an energy gap which is this much, which means when I say overcome the energy gap, basically I am saying that it is going against the heuristic function. We want to maximize, but you want to go down here, you want to go down here maybe 2 3 steps depending on what is the granularity. You want to take 2 3 steps down there and end up in B. And of course, then after that it would have a natural tendency to go up because that is the natural tendency of this algorithm. If it sees a better move as we have seen here, the better the delta E, the better the probability of moving to that move essentially. So, it has a natural tendency of going here. So, to go from, so let us call this E A B and likewise let us call this E C B. To go from A to C, it has to overcome an energy gap of E A B. To go from C to A, it has to overcome an energy gap of E sub B. So, just imagine that there is there is somebody with a helium balloon tied to that person just to visualize so which is trying to pull him up essentially. So, he has to walk down all this way pulling that helium balloon down which is a greater distance essentially. So, a greater energy gap essentially. So, to go from A to C you have to overcome this energy gap and then of course, naturally the algorithm will take you up because it has this tendency of, of going up. To go from C to A, you have to enter a greater energy gap, essentially, which is this E C B essentially. Hmm. Now, if you work through this, <coughs> you can sort of come at the idea which says that there is a greater chance of it moving from A to C essentially. In general, hmm. 
not initially, initially when the temperature is high going up and going down is all the same for this algorithm, it will just do any move randomly. But as the temperature goes lower and lower, it is still not hill climbing, it is still some intermediate temperature, but as that intermediate temperature as you can see the probabilities, unfortunately we have not drawn the probabilities for negative moves, but maybe you should do that and, and see that. that as the temperature goes down, the probability of making negative moves goes down essentially. As the temperature becomes 1, the probability of negative moves tends to 0 essentially. Hmm. So, as the temperature goes down, the probability of moving some energy gap will depend on the energy gap essentially. And since this gap is larger than this, it is more likely that the algorithm will go from A to B and then to C. And remember that this B to C is kind of automatic in the sense that it is the most likely behavior because of the this thing and it is less likely that it will come down from C to B and then go to A essentially. And this is specially the case as temperature is brought down essentially. So, you can see in, in some sense you can see that temperature it is is its ability to go down in this slope essentially. As temperature is high the algorithm has higher ability to go down or, or you can say go down greater distances essentially. As we gradually reduce the temperature, its ability to go down in this, remember this is a maximization problem, decreases, which means that it is it's easier for it to go from A to B than it is to come from C to B, which means that it is more likely to end up in C. Because after the temperature has become really down, if it happens to be here, it will go to C, if it happens to be here, it will go to A essentially that is hill climbing part of it essentially. So, this is a kind of intuition behind simulated annealing that initially you allow the algorithm to explore many different parts, but gradually bring down the temperature in the process in some sense pushing it towards the max global maxima essentially, pushing it towards higher peaks in this example essentially. Why? Because it is at any given temperature which is not infinite, I mean if you assume 10 raise to 10 is infinite, it is more likely that it will climb down from a local peak than it is from a higher peak, which means it is more likely that it will climb up to the higher peak from a local peak, which means that it is very likely that it will go from A to C essentially at any given temperature. And eventually you bring the temperature down, so that it kind of just goes to the nearest peak that it is, it is at. Actually, I have there is a there is a simpler version of a randomized algorithm which I have not mentioned, but it this is probably a good time to mention it. That algorithm is called iterated hill climbing. And what it essentially does, and this is this works in the solution space. So, something like if you are solving SAT or solving TSP or something like that, where you are looking for a solution, you are not looking for a path from the start state to the goal state. In fact, there is no notion of a go start state. So, n queens for example, there is no start state unless of course, you want to think of the empty board as a start state, but that is not really critical to the solving the problem. So, if you want to solve n queens, you have to find arrive at the final solution somehow or the other essentially. And so, when we look at the solution space search and perturbation methods, you could start at any random location essentially. So, again consider SAT as an example, you can choose any supposing you have n variables, you could choose any assignment for those n variables and that is the starting point from which you apply those operators that we discussed earlier essentially. So, what iterated hill climbing says is essentially that, that choose a random set of starting points in the domain. So, in this example it would mean choose one here, choose one here, choose one here, choose one here and so on. So, put it in some kind of a loop, choose random start and simply do hill climbing, do not do anything else just do hill climbing. So, you can imagine 
that if I were to do this, then this starting point would take me to this maxima, this starting point will take me to this maxima and so on and so forth. And if you have chosen a sufficiently large number of random starting points, then one of them is likely to hit your global maxima. So, that is a hope. Of course, it depends on the nature of the surface. If it is very jagged, then you may need many, many starting points, but if the surface is like this, then you can see that if you start anywhere between this range, means anywhere here and you will end up in this global maximum. So, iterative hill climbing is a very simple algorithm. It says that do many hill climbing searches, but start at different randomly selected points. And because hill climbing is simple, computationally this algorithm is simple essentially. You can also think of this as a parallel search that you start all these searches at the same time and all of them happen at the same time. So, after the end you just find what is the best candidate that you have got and you return that as an answer essentially. So, there is something to be said with more than one candidates, searching with more than one candidate. So, we have already seen a couple of examples, beam search searches through always selects B best candidates in the next level and so on if you remember. This is a little bit like beam search in the sense that except that you these things are not allowed to interact with each other. So, this will have its own trajectory, this will have its own trajectory and so on, but there are these B parallel searches taking place. Does it make sense for two candidates to interact in some way. If you are doing a search in which there are many candidates like a parallel search like this, does it make sense for two candidates to interact? We will address that in the next class which will be and we will stop here with this. So, that is a new algorithm that we will look at which is based on working with a population of candidates which are allowed to interact with each other in some sense. Okay, we'll stop here.